It's the year of 1777, and the second year of the American Revolutionary War is drawing to an end. With no decisive victories, the British High Command decided to make a change in tactics. They began noticing the significant importance of New York to the structure of the entire 13 colonies. It not only was the border between the more loyal middle colonies and the disobedient New England colonies, but also was the neck of the 13 colonies. If the British could take New York, they would have driven a wedge into the colonies and break the young America into two pieces. This strategy was executed by three pincer advance. Three separate British forces would drive from the north, south, and west to meet at Albany, thus fracturing New York into small pieces. However, matters quickly took a complete turn for the British. The western pincer, led by Barry St. Ledger, had stalled at the failed siege of Fort Stanwix. Furthermore, William Howe, who was supposed to be leading the southern pincer, diverted his attention to taking Philadelphia, and he did not even set off to be part of the three pincer plan. And so it was that by the beginning of the 1777 autumn, only the northern pincer was still advancing. The regiments making up this pincer were led by the illustrious British general John Burgoyne and his campaign had been so far quite successful, forcing the Northern Department of the Continental Army in a constant retreat, through victories at Fort Crown Point and Fort Ticonderoga. Burgoyne's confidence, though, is withering. Supply issues, ever since the start of his campaign, were bearing down upon him, and now he faced a hard decision between swift advance or retreat. He decided to press on, hoping to achieve complete victory before his army was crippled by severe lack of provisions. General Horatio Gates, commander of the Continental Army's Northern Department, had recently re received reinforcements from Washington, the latter who had realized America's peril if the British succeeded in taking New York. Gates, now feeling more confident, marched north to the high ground on Bemis Heights near the town of Saratoga, and began construction of defensive fortifications. There, they set camp with high hopes and waited for the British. The date was September 19, 1777. The Continental Army's Northern Department was about to face the British in open battle after nearly two months of falling back. And one of the most important battles in the American Revolutionary War is about to begin. Burgoyne arrived some days later with his men and closed in upon the Americans. His army consisted of about 7,200 men and was deployed in a slightly curved line, advancing towards Freeman's farm. The British right flank was commanded by Simon Fraser, and the latter's main objective was to gain the high ground on the left on the, of the American camp. The British center was commanded by James Hamilton, consisting of four British regiments, while the British left was made up of mostly Hessians, British hired German troops, led by Baron Reidesel. Gates, though wishing to wait for the British to make the first move, nonetheless sent General Benedict Arnold with minor forces to march forward and attack the British in the dense woods of Freeman's farm. This advanced American force was mostly made up of the best sharpshooters of the Continental Army, called Morgan's Riflemen, led by Daniel Morgan, who would pick off enemy soldiers from the dense wood ahead. They were followed by a single infantry regiment. They soon began picking off officers of the British regiments from their advantageous perch amidst the trees near Freeman's farm. After a few minutes of gunfire, the Americans charged out and scattered the British advance forces, but their triumph was momentary, as then the main British center led by Hamilton pressed forward and they were forced to retreat into the woods, heavily outnumbered. Meanwhile, Gates, hearing that his advanced forces were in trouble, sent most of his regiments forward as reinforcements, though he still kept many men in reserve. Fraser, who was in command of the British right flank, advanced on the American left flank, threatening a flanking maneuver. However, they were held temporarily by an inferior continental force, consisting of militiamen from Connecticut. As the American left flank was struggling, a fierce battle was raging on the center of the battlefield. Arnold, in command of four regiments, was firing against the numerically comparable British forces, 
while Morgan's men picked off British officers from a distance. Both sides were struggling to gain the upper hand, and as the firing reached a climax, ill news came for the Continental Army. Their left flank was buckling under pressure, and their outnumbered regiments were pushed back. What was more, as Fraser advanced, he was threatening to turn the American flank. If that wasn't enough, a large British force was marching towards the colonial right, commanded by Baron Rydisor. Now, Burgoyne had a chance to flank the Americans on both sides. Arnold, seeing the progression of the British on the left flank, requested more men from Gates, who reinforced his men on the battlefield with most of his last reserves. With additional reinforcements, the American left flank was able to hold Fraser's attack, but the British still threatened to flank the militias from the right. Fortunately for the Americans, darkness settled in, and Arnold was able to withdraw back to the American camp on Bamis Heights, leaving the British still holding the field. This first engagement was called the Battle of Freeman's Farm, and is also known as the First Battle of Saratoga. During the interlude between the two battles, much happened in the camps of both sides. Burgoyne was still low in supplies, and he wished to attack as soon as possible. However, he received a letter from Henry Clinton, the British general now in command of the garrison in New York City, who said that he could hope to make an advance towards Saratoga and hopefully crush the Continental Army between the two forces. But Clinton's advance stalled before even reaching West Point, and September drew to an end. Burgoyne's supplies were now at an all-time low, and he knew he could not last much longer in such a stalemate. He wanted to attack. However, one of his senior officers, Simon Fraser, opposed this idea and proposed a retreat, but Burgoyne, deeming that a retreat would be dishonorable, decided to advance. He was now outnumbered as he had little more than 5,000 men, and thus dug many redoubts to protect his camp. Then, he prepared for his attack. Meanwhile, on the American side, further reinforcements reached Gates after the Battle of Freeman's Farm, and his army now consisted of well over 12,000 men. Tensions, however, between Gates and Arnold were high. Gates, in his report to Washington about the first battle, had not even mentioned Arnold's name, who should have deserved most of the credit since he had commanded the men on the field. Gates, annoyed by how all his officers and men supported the truth that Arnold, instead of himself, should be given most of the credit gained during the Battle of Freeman's Farm, relieved Arnold of his command, after an, an argument with the latter. However, Gates decided to keep him in his camp for some time. September drew to an end, and on October 7th, 1777, the British launched their attack on the American left flank with Fraser's men and instantly the Colonials swarmed up in defense. Morgan's riflemen were on the left, while the regiments under Ennick Poor formed the center and right of the American line. A total of 8,000 Continentals came to the field, and marched up to confront the Redcoats, who fired upon them. Poor, initially holding back his fire, unleashed volley after volley at the British when Fraser tried to make a bayonet charge. Taking heavy casualties, and with the enemy threatening to turn their flanks, the British retreated towards their fortifications. During this initial engagement, the British lost 400 men, and the Americans captured or killed many of their officers. Gates pressed forward his men, sending additional reinforcements, hoping to obtain victory and capture the British camp, which was protected by a series of earthen walls Burgoyne had prematurely constructed. Along with these new re reinforcements came also Benedict Arnold, who rode forward single-handedly to the front lines. Whether he had or had not permission from Gates to ride to battle is still debated, but he charged forward valiantly at the front of his men, lifting the American morale. The militias attacked the British right flank, which was protected by two redoubts. The outermost one was commanded by Henry von Bremen, with about 300 Hessians, while the other was commanded by Lord Balcaris. From a protected position, the men in the redoubts fired upon the advancing Americans, and fierce battling ensued. Though the militias outnumbered the British, the Redcoats were able to hold their ground when firing behind their fortifications. The Amer American advance had been faltering from some time, held off by Balcaras and Bremen's men. But soon, after both sides took some casualties, matters took a complete turn. Morgan's men had secretly circled around the British right flank, 
and met with Arnold, but led a valiant charge through the strip of land between the two redoubts. Together, they exposed the British freer, and charged under fire towards the redoubts, which had been constructed very skillfully. It was a fierce and desperate struggle, but at length, the British, sustaining heavy casualties, began scattering, and the redoubt was taken. Brayman was killed, and Arnold was shot in the leg, but aside from the officers, both sides also lost many men in this engagement. The Battle of Bemis Heights completely extinguished all British hopes for a quick victory, or even a chance of standing against the Americans. The losses of the day, which had totaled up to more than 1,000 redcoats, put the British at a 1-3 to three numerical disadvantage. And the fall of the redoubts also meant the exposure of the British camp. Burgoyne knew that his army would be destroyed when the day came. Thus, keeping his campfires burning, he secretly withdrew under the cover of darkness. By the following day, he was back at his position before the battles of Saratoga. But even so, the Americans pressed forward during the days following the battle, and with their superior forces and advantages gained during the battle, managed to surround the British. After some negotiations between both sides, Burgoyne finally surrendered to the Americans. The battles of Saratoga were a stunning victory for the Continental Army, and the British three pincer plan to take New York completely failed. However, unlike the Battle of Trenton and the Battle of Princeton, the battles of Saratoga not only gave confidence to the Americans, but also proved to the French the capability of the militias. From that day on, the Franco-American alliance between France and America was established, which marked a major turning point in the American Revolution. The battles of Saratoga were won by the Americans, aside from superiority of tactics, mostly because of Burgoyne's lack of support. His campaign had been successful, but too often checked by shortages of supplies and lack of reinforcements. Burgoyne's advantage during the Battle of Freeman's Farm were completely compromised to the Americans, just because Gates had reinforcements and Burgoyne had none. The latter was an illustrious and greatly capable general, but without constant support, he could only win small engagements, but not long campaigns, like his southern advance that ended in the battles of Saratoga. 